Hello, and thank you for joining today's webinar, The Importance of Grounding and Bonding the Physical Infrastructure. I am Jane Kacharzik with Panduit, and I will be facilitating this webinar. Just a little housekeeping before we begin. This webinar is being recorded. It will be available soon on demand, and registrants will receive a copy. All lines will be muted during the webinar. Following the webinar, there will be a question and answer session. Please feel free to submit your questions utilizing the chat box on the GoToWebinar app. Today's presenter, John Sinise, is a senior principal engineer within corporate research and development at Panduit. John started with Panduit in 2011 and has an industrial technology degree from Illinois State University and a master's degree in industrial and systems engineering from Northern Illinois University. Prior to joining Panduit, he was a co-owner and vice president of an industrial systems integration company for 12 years. In his current position at Panduit, John works on supporting new product development with the enterprise and industrial business units through research and development. He leads Panduit's involvement in the Converge Plantwine Ethernet architecture team, which along with Rockwell Automation and Cisco, publishes design and implementation guides for industrial spaces. Before we get started today, I would like to hand the call over to Colin, who will talk a few minutes about CSIA. Colin, I'll hand the call over to you. Thank you, Jane. As she mentioned, my name is Colin Hammond and I am with CSIA. Um, next slide, please. For those of you who are unfamiliar with CSIA, we are a global nonprofit professional association with over 500 member companies in 40 countries. Our mission is to advance the practice of control system integration to benefit our members and their clients. Our vision is to ensure that manufacturing and process industries everywhere have access to low risk, safe and successful application of automation technology. Next slide, please. CSI membership offers members access to resources needed to attain and exceed business goals. To highlight just a few of our many member benefits, the CSIA Best Practices Manual guides control system integration companies in the setup and running of a solid company. CSIA's Business Insurance Program offers members an excellent insurance program for business owners, subcontractors, and more. The program includes members from all over the world enjoying the peace of mind that comes with CSIA insurance. Clients in all industries are now seeking integrators with a CSIA certification alongside ISO. They recognize CSIA certified integrators' commitment to industry standard and business acumen. As a result, being certified can shorten the sales cycle. Next slide, please. The CSIA Industrial Automation Exchange is the premier automation guide featuring system integrators and suppliers who provide industrial, manufacturing, and process automation solutions. For integrators and suppliers, it's a place to market their expertise. Clients will find white papers, case studies, capabilities, contact information, and engage in conversation directly with CSIA members. Uh, next slide, please. Please follow CSIA's online events calendar for all upcoming webinars. CSI webinars are opportunities given to CSI's industry partners to address hot topics and demonstrate their expertise. You won't want to miss these opportunities to learn from the comfort of your own office or home. And for more information about CSIA, please visit our website or contact us at info at staff.controlsys.org or 847-686-2245. And with that, I would like to pass it over to our presenter. Welcome, John. Thank you, Colin. And thank you for the intro, Jane. Um, so I will go ahead and skip this slide. But as Jane said, my name's John Sinise. Um, I'm a senior principal engineer at Panduit. There's my picture on the upper right. And on the, on the lower right, you can see the, um, that's the Panduit JECIC Innovation Center. That's where our testing labs, engineering headquarters, um, we don't do production in that building. Um, it's all of the engineering and the um, and product testing um, in that facility. So here's a, just a quick overview of what we wanna go over today. Um, broke it down into four different sections. Wanna spend most of the time on the, the first couple, the grounding and bonding background, and then best practices that go along with grounding and bonding. But with that, it's um, 
important to cover codes and standards. And then my final section I have, I want to touch on what we call CPWE, which stands for Converge Plant-Wide Ethernet, and then additional resources that can be used uh, when it comes to designing and implementing different grounding and bonding systems. So we'll start with some of the background. Um, why ground and bond in the first place? Uh, what are the types of interference? And um, one of the, the biggest topics for this would be uh, ground loops as a disturbance that happens often in the real world and it's um, greatly misunderstood, but somewhat easy to prevent with some um, prevention measures. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Okay, so why grounding and bonding? Uh, electrical grounding required by code. Um, one of the, the challenges with that though is code doesn't always take into effect the performance. So mainly you're grounding for personal safety and to protect hardware. This will improve your network and equipment performance and integrity when properly done. And the, um, the, the takeaway here for when you're looking to design the system is you know, proper grounding and bonding provides a path for current to return to its source without damaging equipment. So some quick definitions, um, it's the terms, grounding is a term to describe a connection path to the earth, pretty self-explanatory. Bonding is a term to describe a connection path that equalizes electrical potential differences or allows for current to return to its source. And there's been some confusion in the past when you, you know, if you read through some older standards, um, whether it's manufacturer's instructions or even things with the uh, NEC from the past, Grounding and bonding, sometimes people use those terms interchangeably, but there is a decisive difference and you know, we're gonna cover some of the basics of that today. So there's a fallacy behind the common acceptedly phrased path of least resistance. When it comes to grounding, it takes all paths. And that's where a lot of the problems arise where when you do have a problem you, and you don't want um, electricity to go through certain paths, but go through others, that's when the grounding and bonding system design takes um, takes place. So this topic is often overlooked. Um, you know, one of the, the great ways to summarize this, if you look on the right side there, we have a, a graphic that shows you the, the focus of a, a typical project. So when you get into control systems, the, um, the design, whether it's, um, you know, machine building or long conveyor lines, the software is usually the most discussed topic and also the highest cost. And with typical IT hardware, you know, you're replacing in, you know, every couple of years and that is going to be refreshed along with um, updates and um, people will be paying more attention to that piece of it. So it's 60% of the cost and two years longevity. Networking is right behind it. We get into it's about 23% of the cost and will last around five years. Operations, 10% of the costs will go for five years. The infrastructure is the piece that will last the longest at 25 years, but it's only 7% of a typical budget. And the irony behind that is most of the network problems are caused by the infrastructure. So when you get into some kind of communications problem, you know, it could be the software, it could be something with the switch, but most of the time you get into, is it a, um, is it a badly terminated cable? Is it the wrong type of cable? Is there noise in the cable? So it's, you know, that's why I said that's often overlooked. Uh, failures that are due to inadequate grounding are unrecognized and usually attributed to other causes. And the standards that go along with this are, you know, some of them are newer than others, but often they're misunderstood or they're not used at all. Um, you know, a lot of times because it is lower here on the totem pole that um, it doesn't get the attention that it requires and then it causes problems in the future. So we'll start with some of the basics. What is electrical noise? So generally speaking, electrical noise is the result of electrical signals getting transferred into circuits, uh, basically where they're not wanted, and they disrupt the communication signal. More technically, the definition here, electrical noise is voltage spikes, generated by the routine operation of selected system components, which we refer to as the source, that interferes, and it could interfere in different ways, we call that a coupling mechanism, with the routine operation of other selected system components, which we call victims. So you can see on the graph here, we have a, the blue line signifies the uh, source wire, and the green line would be the victim wire. 
the source wire interference is the is the red line that can be transferred to the victim wire in different ways. So there's many different types of sources, um, you know, VFDs type uh, pulse width modulated devices where you have a, a fast switching signal which can cause that noise. Also switching power supplies, you know, 24 volt DC, very common in industrial control panels, also generates um, some bit of noise and contact switching of inductive loads. What are the victims? Typical ethernet communications is probably the, you know, one of the biggest ones, but when you get into any type of high speed or analog communication, you know, you have an encoder on a machine or you have other types of um, fast switching or critical uh, inputs on a system that could change an output based on a, on a wrong signal. So I don't want to get too technical here, but I just want to touch on some general types of interference. So there's four different ones, the first being uh, capacitive coupling. So this is often referred to as electrostatic noise and is a voltage-based effect. Any conductor separated by an insulating material, uh, including even the air, constitutes a capacitor. Um, and capacitance is part of any circle or circuit. The potential for Capacitive coupling increases as frequency increases. As uh, industrial networks move towards faster speed, one gig or even 10 gig, that higher frequency can lead to potential interference issues. So lightning discharge is an example of a charge building up then dissipating. Um, probably an extreme example, but um, would fall under our capacitive coupling. Secondly, um, we have inductive coupling. So this is a current-based effect. Magnetic coupled noise, uh, every conductor with current flowing through it has an associated magnetic field. So a changing current can induce current in another circuit, even if it is just a single loop or wire. The source circuit basically acts as a transformer primary, and the victim would be the secondary. So if you look at the picture on the lower right there, that kind of gives you a, a basic illustration of what a transformer would, would look like. So the inductive coupling effect increases as you have more current flow or it changes at a, at a fast rate. Um, and also the, the proximity of the two conductors would be um, one of the, the most telltale sign that you have a, a problem with that. So inductive and capacitive coupling are referred to as near field effects um, since they're prominent at short distance. And as you separate them, um, the distance decrease their effects. So this helps explain one of the, the noise mysteries where you know you can slightly reposition a wire and see the effect of it change. So when they're in close proximity, these become issues. So in addition to those also have conducted noise and electromagnetic radiation, which uh, radio frequency would be the main focus there. So Conducted noise is something's directly connected to the system that is introducing interference. So coupled noise, like the capacitive inductive that we just talked about, gets to the victim wire a little differently, but ends up being noise conducted on the actual victim wire. While all coupled noise ends up as conducted noise, this term is generally used to refer to a noise coupled by a direct connection or galvanic connection. So included in this category would be circuits that have shared conductors, if you get into neutrals, grounds, um, you know, or if you have any type of leakage current where you could get a stray signal onto you know, some kind of common plane and that would affect signals of um, lesser amplitudes. And then you would see a negative effect on the data being transferred there. So in the, in the event of leakage current, those are usually pretty easy to find because if you turn off the device, um, that problem instantly disappears. So the one on the bottom there, electromagnetic radiation. Um, so an example of that is radio transmission. Industrial control wiring systems are sometimes large antennas that can radiate noise signals um, from the open air. RFI ranges are typically higher frequencies, um, ranging from 10 kilohertz to hundreds of megahertz, and sometimes even higher. Um, and at, at these higher frequencies, lengths of wire start acting like transmitting and receiving antennas. So the noise circuit acts as a transmitter and the victim circuit um, will be acting as a receiving antenna. 
luckily RFI can be mediated by, you know, with some designs and some proper planning up front. And um, this, so conducted noise in RFI is um, a focus of a lot of the European regulations, more so than it is in the US, but it's, it's still a, something to consider for both. The actual transfer for radio frequency is um, actually not as common. Um, we have some different experiments we've done in the lab and when you want to replicate it, it's very challenging. Uh, when it does happen in the field though, it is um, hard to figure out where it's coming from, but once you can do that, then it's um, somewhat easier to mediate from there. Okay, so that's basically four types of noise just to give you a little background and level set what we're um what we're designing around so as i mentioned before ground loops ground loops is um very common in electrical systems and just to give you an idea of what that looks like so what's a ground loop two points that are intended to be at the same potential often ground but they're at different potentials and then you get undesirable current flowing through devices that weren't intended to uh, dissipate that current so you can see in the picture we have uh, equipment A on the left, equipment B on the right, and they have different paths to earth ground. So we're running uh, one amp through both. They have different impedance. The equipment A has 10 ohms and equipment B has five ohms. So here um, you're gonna have a difference between, a potential difference between equipment A and equipment B. So if you were to connect say a network cable or something there that had a shield, current would try to flow on that. So how would that look if we were to correct that? So if we change and we bond equipment B to equipment A, then you would have all of the current flowing to earth there. The two amps would go through that 10 ohm impedance on the lower left. So as you can see then, we have a zero volt potential difference between equipment A and equipment B. So in this case now, if you did connect something from A to B, you wouldn't have to worry about a ground loop forming um, within that. So to, to show more of a, um, what an actual installation would look like, that was just kind of a, a block diagram to, to show you. Um, this is a multi-point ground system, just an illustration of one. So as you can see, we have on the lower left, we have our service coming in where, um, we have a ground, an earth ground on the far left, and then it's the service is bonded to there. We also have um, some frame from the building grounded, and then example of like a water pipe that has a ground. And the control panel is connected to that. And then on the right side, we have um, a, a machine that has an HMI panel on it, and it has its own ground. And this is a very common way that grounds have been done in the past. In fact, I know for um, a lot of our Panduit manufacturing facilities for years, our standard procedure, you know, this goes back to probably the 80s and 90s, but, you know, we would pound ground rods all the way into the, the earth to make connections at each panel. And the, the risk you run here is that if they're at different potentials from one to the other, that's when you run the risk of um, a ground loop. So in this, so um, if this situation here, let's say we run a shielded cable from the control panel to the HMI panel. So maybe you have a PLC in the control panel and you want to connect your HMI with a network connection and it's you know on a machine located on the, the other side of a certain area. So the issue here now is if the ground from that HMI panel is at a different potential than the grounds on the left side, you could get your ground loop, which basically from this red line would show you, well, now we can have a path that would flow like this and not necessarily directly to its grounds. So if it is a, um, a higher current or um, switching frequency, then you might have some data interference on that shielded cable, which is the, the blue line on the top. So if this happens, what can we do to remedy this type of situation? So we can add what we call an equalization conductor, which basically is gonna put that control panel and the HMI panel at the same potential. Um, there are some stipulations for how you do this, um, as far as how long it can be, what size conductor it can be. 
um, that is referenced in um, a couple different standards. Um, TIA is one of them, and I'll I'll show you at the end of this presentation some of the other ones you can you can use as a reference for for this type of installation. So what this would do is this would give a um, connection from the control panel to that HMI panel where that current can travel instead of going over our sensitive shielded cable. So one other quick thing to mention here I have on the, the left side is, um, you know, per code, a grounding system shall be intentional, visually verifiable, and adequately sized. So one thing to point out there is where, you know, if we ran that shielded cable, that blue line in a piece of conduit, you know, someone could say like, oh, well, that's, you know, a ground conductor that's going to provide my equalization. And the, the challenge with that is going to be if it's not intended to be uh, specifically for grounding, it may not meet um, certain codes. So that's where you get into what they call an equalization conductor, which is something you would run inside the conduit to bring those two points to the same potential. So another way to approach this, um, installing equipment bonding jumpers that connect at the bounding bus bar creates an equal potential or equipotential grounding system. So as you can see, this is different from the previous slide where we had several connections directly to earth ground. Whereas in this setup, we will have bonded connections back to a single point ground. So this will eliminate, also eliminate the potential for a ground loop. Because now, as you can see, when we have that connection on top, um, the ground for the control panel and the HMI panel can clearly go back to the same ground because they'll have the same potential. They won't have a difference where ground will want to travel um, within it. Unfortunately, one of the things we see in the field is when there is a problem with with a ground connection, often to solve it, um, you know, maintenance or someone will try to remove one of the grounds to eliminate the problem. And as you can see from these two, when you do that, uh, the current that's seeking uh, to get back to its source is going to find another path. And that's not necessarily a path that you would prefer. So it's one of the things we definitely discourage as far as a troubleshooting tactic. So one final slide for this section. Um, probably the most common question we get is where do ground shields on a network cable? So three different schools of thought here. Uh, you can ground it at both ends, ground it at one end, or not ground it at all. So we definitely recommend grounding at both ends. Um, we've tested this out in um, many different lab tests as far as just over time from field testing also. So there are some um, disclaimers there, like we just discussed, if you have, uh, if you have them the both ends at the same potential, you have nothing to worry about as far as a ground loop. When you do connect the cable, if there are differences, that would be, you know, that could create a ground loop, but then you would have problems. And that's one of the um, reasons that this discussion comes up often, where if someone has a problem, like ground at both ends of a network cable, they disconnect one end of the ground and then it works, solves the problem, then the school of thought is adopted, well, it's better to ground at one end. So in the event of a ground loop, yes, it would fix that, but overall the benefits are better grounding it at both ends. So as I mentioned, you could, you could use the equalization conductors to fix the problem. There's also um, grounding through a filtering circuit, which I'll cover later more in the next section. But just for a, um, a sketch of that on the bottom, if you could follow through, there's um, quite a bit of detail in there. But basically what it's showing is the green path is our, our path of our shield. So we want that connected from one side to the other with, um, you know, we have shielded patch cords that are going through patch panels and are connecting from an ethernet switch on the left side to an end device on the right side. So in this diagram, we show the, the RC there, which is basically a filtering circuit that's connecting the shield to ground, but it's showing that uh, basically it is grounded on both ends and that that would be the preferred method. And with the filtering, it's probably the most effective way to um, install a shielded cable. So I mentioned about the grounding wet end. You also have the possibility of um, the antenna effect, and it's it's not good at um, dissipating radio frequencies. 
it would eliminate a ground loop, but like I said, there's other ways to deal with that. And finally, the option of not grounding provides very limited protection. Um, you basically have a, a piece of shield in there that will um, absorb some different um, electrical problems, but it has nowhere to dissipate it. Then there's some more technical things with standing waves or reflection. Um, there's a paper I referenced at the end of this if you want to read more of the details of um, the problems with that. Okay, so that kind of covers the, the basics, the background. Um, now we have these different types of noises. We have these problems. What can we do to prevent it? So we'll go through some best practices, show the preventive measures and um, how we can improve that situation. So five different preventative measures are listed here. The segregation, shielding, bonding and grounding, filtering and suppression. So we'll go through those um, in detail, but that is the five we're gonna talk about. So preventive measure of segregation. So this, this control panel is a, a great picture to, to kind of summarize this one. Um, we're separating sources and victims of electrical noise into zones. So the uh, if you can't put a barrier in between them, the, the amount of air gap you need typically is six inches. That will give you space that you'll know for sure that you won't have interference between a couple wires. So designing the panel with hardware segregation in mind, uh, you avoid designing for neatness, tradition, and, or convenience. So I like that term because it happens a lot where, you know, it's always been done this way, so that's why we're going to do it. Or, you know, I need the, the drives located on this side, so it's, you know, more convenient to get to them when I open the panel. Um, other other reasons that don't take into account the um, the possibilities of noise interfering in the, the control system. So color coding is a great way to do this where anyone can walk up to it and know which zone is which. So just to give you an idea of what this uh, color code is, the, the white duct in there is the clean DC low voltage. When you get into gray, it's more uh, what we call like dirty wiring, uh, typical AC wiring. And if it's more extreme, uh, we call very dirty, then you're getting into variable frequency dries, any, any type of pulse width modulization, high switching frequencies, that would be the black duct. So if you see it in the bottom there, um, there's a couple pieces that uh, illustrate black being the, you know, the most noisy area. And this one has intrinsically safe wiring, so that's usually indicated with blue blue wiring and blue ducts. Um, you know, there's also some rules you got to watch with that, where even even by code you can't be within um, two inches of other types of wiring, um, just because of the risk of a wiring a, another stray wire hitting it and um, sending higher voltage to a hazardous area. So it, it does get challenging to do this segregation. Obviously, um, you may have to use more panel space. So then you'd wanna take into account, what else can I do to um, free up some panel space? So newer components now have smaller footprints. Um, there's different types of wiring duct you can use. There's different types of mechanical barriers. So if you don't have the six inches of airspace that you need, you can get into a mechanical barrier that would um, basically give you that six inches without um, needing to take all that all that room. So I have a couple other ones here I can show you when we um, when we get into that. So the second preventive measure is shielding. So we, we talked about using shielded cable and metal barriers to reduce noise. There are different types of shielding cable. Um, you know, unshield cable has improved over the years and there's uh, tighter twist rates now with um, CAT 6A and CAT 7, and it does do a great job to protect against crosstalk, you know, which is you know interference between conductors. But when you get into the industrial environments, there's other factors such as you know this electrical interference that comes into play, and the shielded cable would be needed. Um, I should mention too, if you get into extreme cases, uh, if you're you know you're trying to dissipate too much of the the noise interference. Fiber is still the best solution for um, noise immunity because it's inherent, just because it's only light signals, there's no copper there to interfere with. And 
the the key to mention like we said before with the shielding cable is if installed incorrectly it can introduce new problems um, it's really important to take some time to go through the design and make sure it is grounded correctly it is specced correctly or using the proper type um, there's a lot of different types of shielded cables you know i list some here the you know you'll see these abbreviations, FUTP, SUTP. Um, there's just different types of uh, foiled shield, braided shields, and combinations within. So um, again, that mostly goes into the design part of it. Uh, an interesting fact here in the United States, about 10% of our communication cables are shielded, while in Europe, about 90% is shielded. And you know why is that? They spend a lot more time with codes and inspections on looking for ground loops and making sure um, equipment is at the same potential. Uh, in fact, the IEC code has some testing requirements for ground loops, um, which they do not, you know, we do not have in, in North America. It's not as common. So the grounding systems are not as good typically in North America as they are in Europe. And that's why there's more uh, shielded cable in Europe. So as I mentioned, the shielded wiring duct and noise shield are you know, pieces of equipment you can use to uh, obtain that protection. So just to give you an idea what that looks like, here's a uh, typical noise shield. This can be used just straight in a, you know, mounted right to a sub panel. You can run wires. There's even cable tie slots. You can tie them right up to that. Or um, the way I, I think the, the most effective way to use it is putting it into wiring duct, which is nice because you can make two channels. Um, you know, as we were showing before, you have different colors or color coding for your control panel design, where, you know, this is, we can use one duct now to have, um, you know, maybe some low voltage DC wire and AC wire in the same one, but when it's separated by this metal barrier, then you have enough protection um, for that. And if you want to go a step further, you could use shielded wiring duct also. So um, this would be easier when you're trying to color code the duct because you can put um, tops on them with different colors. But the um, this would allow you to put a you know a noise victim or source either one in, and you would have protection because you have the continuous foil shield on the outside of this duct that would provide your um, noise reduction. So. Basically what it's gonna do is any of that EMI noise, it's dissipating to ground. So absorbing that signal before it gets into um, um, possibly interfering with your victim wires. So bonding and grounding is essential and pretty much the focus of this presentation. And I just wanted to show a, a few different pictures of um, what that looks like. So the I show a, gal, a galvanized sub panel there. The, the white panels are good. They, they look good. They brighten up the panel, but they contain an insulating paint layer, which has potential of isolating a connection. So when you're installing the, the white sub panels, you have to have a paint cutting washer and they're not always properly installed. So uh, we definitely recommend using these type of panels. And it's, it's a better grounding plane. Um, and it's easier to connect to all your devices that, you know, keep them at the same potential like we talked about before. So in the, um, when you're working on certain devices too, so in the lower right corner there, I show a, uh, a grounding strap for your wrist. Um, so as important as it is to, you know, bond all the equipment to the same potential, an overlooked or often overlooked um, asset is the person that's working on it. So if you if you get into sensitive equipment, you want to make sure that you know your body has a ground path too, so you don't bring static electricity, touch something, and you could easily short out um, you know a sensitive device. So that's another one to keep in mind. And finally, there on the um, there's two sets of three bonding straps on the right. So we have the the braided ones, and then the green and yellow painted to mark them as ground. So this is what we refer to as high frequency bonding. This provides a low impedance path for high frequency noise currents to return to their source. So typically you'd see a, um, a standard uh, machine tool wire, 12 gauge wire that would go from, you know, like the panel door to the, the housing of the cabinet to ground the door. And that 
you know, is effective at, you know, for a, a safety ground and it will, you know, allow current to travel through it. But when you get into, um, like we we're saying these, the higher frequency devices, VFDs, that kind of stuff where you, you have a higher frequency traveling, it moves differently through wires. So that's where these um, bonding straps come into play. And just to, just to give you a little more detail on that, that's the, um, what we call the skin effect. So that skin effect causes the uh, effective resistance of the conductor to increase at higher frequencies. The electric current flows mainly on the skin of the conductor or the outside of the conductor at an average depth called the skin depth. So you can see on the, the chart on the lower right here, just gives you an idea of how fast that um, goes up. So a 60 Hertz frequency has a skin depth of 0.33 inches, but if you get in a six megahertz, you know, then it's 0 0.001 inches. So that um, current wants to travel on the outside of it. So ideally, if you can, you know, picture if you had a, a pipe for your ground, that would be an ideal way to dissipate this type of, of noise because it's going to the, you know, the skin effect where it would, you know, most of it would travel through the outside of it. So that's the, um, the engineering behind the design of these straps are optimizing that um, surface area to dissipate that frequency. And as when we get into faster networks, you know, CAT 5E, typically runs at 100 megahertz, you get up to CAT 6A, you're at 500 megahertz. So, you know, like I said before, as you get into industrial networks that are going towards one gig, um, you know, that used to be, you know, only a, a hundred, then it's 10 times faster speed. This becomes more of an issue when you have these higher frequencies. So it's um, best practice to use these type of straps. Okay, another preventive measure, filtering. So this is uh, low pass filters to attenuate RF noise. And I briefly showed this on that um, picture when properly shielding a cable. These RC filters are effective. Um, ideally, they're, they're mounted inside the device. Um, filters typically found on communication modules, gateways, remote IO comm cards. They're, they're not as often in switches anymore. There used to be, there used to be more um, dominant in that design. They're not as much, but you um, it's hard to tell if you have that device termination. Uh, the manufacturer sometimes will put it in their their technical documentation, but it can be hard to find. A uh, quick way that we found is you can always measure this. Uh, if you have a typical industrial switch, if you measure from the, the actual shielded connection around the jack, um, you know, a lot of times there's a metal there enough where you could take a multimeter, touch it from there to its to its chassis ground and see if you read that resistor. So um, a lot of times it's one meg ohm and you could do a quick read and see if that kind of filter is built in. Um, you know, this, this filter is um, very effective. It opens up ground loops, uh, provides a low impedance path at high frequencies and a high impedance path at low frequencies for that shield termination. So this is effective at uh, reducing ground noise currents, um, you know, and, and the other things we were showing before. Okay, so last preventive measure here is suppression. Um, this one has been around for a while. Um, you're controlling solenoid valves. If you, you know, that's probably the most common. You wanna have a diode or varistor or something to you know, basically um, squelch that um, when it turns off, it wants to draw extra power. So you want to cut that off so you don't have that that bouncing effect on your on your electrical system. So mechanical switches include, like I said, solenoids, but also contactors, relays. Um, and there's a, a graph on the bottom there that just shows you from a scope what it looks like with without suppression and with suppression. So. Again, this is kind of a, a simple thing to put in there, but these can add up when you start having a lot of these in a system. This will generate noise in different ways. Um, so this is an easier one to prevent. Okay, so that's a lot of the, the technical details, the background of you know what is the noise and how do I prevent it. 
So I just want to go through some things here to show um, codes and standards that apply to this that you can use as further references. So this is probably the most common, the National Electric Code. Um, you know, one, one way of looking at the difference between codes and standards is that a code tells you what you need to do and a standard tells you how to do it. So um, an example of that would be, a, you know, code says you have to have a fire alarm system and a standard will tell you what kind of system and how it must work. So, you know, this is the code which gives you a lot of detail for that. And a nice thing that not everyone knows about too is there's handbooks for, for most of these too. So this, this NEC handbook is really helpful. Um, it's a lot longer than the standard NEC book because it gives examples and it gives more details to the explanation of um, some of the stuff inside of it. And these are pictures of the 2020 version. This is the newest, just came out. So it's fresh off the press, um, a lot of updated information and you know a good reference. And um, most, like I said, for North America installations, this you know a lot of times is used for the um, you know the compliance. So another one is the TIE 1005. This is focused towards industrial. Um, so it's it's a shorter one. It, this is only like 35, 40 pages, but it does have a lot of good information um, for industrial specific installations. Um, contains chapters on industrial environments, backbone, horizontal cabling. A lot of the grounding and bonding we talked about is in there. And there is some things on performance requirements. And one of the, uh, one of the charts in it is what we call a mice diagram. So this is uh, this is effective when you want to spec out different equipment and you, you don't know up front is this a noisy environment you know what is my rating so it's a way to put a scale to um, these different classes it's broken up into four different ones the um, so starting in that upper left is mechanical then you have ingress climactic chemical and electromagnetic is the last one so. Mechanicals, pretty self-explanatory, shock, vibration, compression, impact resistance, that kind of thing. Um, ingress, typically your IP rating. So if you see something's IP67, you know it's submersible, um, it's tested to a certain rating, that's when you'd get into this. So the numbers on there uh, increase severity from right to left. So if you get into the I3, that would be your IP67. That's one of the more harsher areas. And um, climactic chemical operation temperature, uh, the rate at change of temperature, sun, that uh, comes into account for that. And then electromagnetic, which we talked a lot about, uh, radiated RF, um, different surges, magnetic fields. So there's, there's different specifications for each of these levels, um, and that's covered in that standard. So next is the TIA 607D. Um, this again is recently published. This is a lot, uh, there's more detail in this than the um, TIA 1005, it's, uh, it's longer, uh, provides basic principles. You know, this gets into components and the design of telecommunications, bonding and grounding, but more generally for buildings that targeted to industrial, um, like the 1005. There is some overlap, but there's more detail into this one. Then I also mentioned too that it's harmonized with ISO and IEC standards, uh, which means it's it's using the same terms and language that that you see in other ones. Um, you know, we talked about the equalization conductor. This is a standard that you would use for that that um, would give you details on the size, the gauge, um, that kind of stuff. So in uh, NFPA 79, this is more of a overall standard for machine building. Um, it's great for system integrators, machine builders, OEMs, a lot of different details. Um, it does cover grounding and bonding and details on wires, uh, different sizes, conduits, different ground types, proper labeling. Um, there's a lot of good information in this one too. Okay, so my last section here is um, CPWE and some other resources to use to get more information. So the, the reason I wanted to um, mention the CPWE, which again stands for Converge Plant-Wide Ethernet, is that um, there's a lot of testing that goes behind these documents. So 
Um, I have some links here at the end to show you, but it's basically a group with Panduit, Rockwell Automation, and Cisco. Um, it's been around for, for many years. There's several different documents out there. The original document was around 550 pages. It was um, very overwhelming, lots of great information, but it was intimidating to look at. So since then, it's been broken up into a lot of different um, standalone documents that are more digestible, smaller chunks of the information and divided by topic. So um, they're good references. And we have a physical infrastructure one that we've finished recently um, that, I'll, that I'll show you here that, that goes into details of a lot of the stuff we talked about today. So there's lab testing facilities um, for each company. Here's just some photos of Panduit's lab. Um, this shows you some of the capabilities we have testing with Rockwell Automation and Cisco there on the, the left-hand side, uh, most of that protocol is Ethernet IP. And on the right side, we get into Profinet, CC Link, um, you know, other international protocols that are also very common outside of North America. So again, it allows us to do testing and the, what's not showed in here is the other testing equipment that's needed that gets down to a uh, packet level or sometimes even a bit error rate. When we're looking at different grounding and bonding systems and these you know these problems can be very elusive and, and hard to troubleshoot so um the technology needed gets down to that that finer detail to help troubleshoot that stuff so some publications um so this this is a deploying a resilient converged plant-wide ethernet architecture uh, one of the things you know Panduit brings to this is you know what we call the um, uh, converting the logical to the physical. So a lot of documents, you know, again back to our diagram showing that most of the the time and money goes to the software network and design, but then when you get to the physical deployment of it, um, there's there's not as much information as far as um, how to actually do it, what materials to use. So a lot of these documents will take you through that. So we have a landing page, that's the www.panduit.com slash cpwe, where we have a reference of all these different documents that can be used. So again, here's the uh, the physical infrastructure one that was done. Um, matter of fact, just last month, we, we had an update for this. So this is uh, several different examples that get into we call the um, in, um, the zone approach. So we can take a network from you know the, the data center side to an industrial distribution frame down to a zone enclosure. So it's similar to like you know a campus model where you get down to the access layer device. But in addition to the the diagrams of all the switches, we map out um, you know here's what is recommended for uh, copper cabling or fiber cabling. And then there's testing as far as, you know, why would you use one versus the other one? And, um, you know, if a circuit was interrupted, how fast will it converge? Is it faster if I use a, you know, copper network or if I use fiber and, um, you know, multi-mode versus single mode? So a lot of those details are in there. And like I said, too, there's, you know, bill of materials. So it's, um, you know, they give, there's samples in it that would get you started for what you need if you you know you want to set up structured cabling but you're not sure well what kind of patch panels do i need um, where do i need to ground it um, that's what would this resource would be very helpful for that okay so just a um a couple more resources uh, if you want more details on the actual testing so um we didn't get into uh, what we call Veramatrix cabling, which is a, a discontinuous shield. Um, we can probably do a whole separate webinar on that. There's um, a lot of science behind this one, but the um, this white paper shows the the impact of you know what we call a that would be a floating shield on electromagnetic immunity of a cable and how it can affect Ethernet communication. Tests show how it can actually reduce EMC performance by a factor of, you know, as much as three with higher packet errors and drop links. So um, this, this white paper is mostly lab tests and it's, you know, very technical, but, you know, if you wanna learn more of 
um, you know, why shields are what they are and how would it work to have a discontinuous shield, um, this would be one to, to look into. And then the last one on the bottom there, the shielded cable for Ethernet applications for an industrial environment application guide. So that one is pretty much a summary of this presentation from today. I know, um, you know, we kind of covered stuff at a high level and, and ran through it pretty fast. But this, you know, if you want uh, a four page summary of, you know, the basics of uh, grounding and bonding and, and noise and um, the standards that go along with it. Um, this is a great one to look at for that. Okay, so you know, we're getting down here. We got about eight minutes left. Um, this is my um, what we reviewed today. Just a, a quick recap. So you know, we talked about the the background of grounding and bonding, why it's important. Um, you know, hopefully showed you the kind of the basics of uh, what noise is, um, how it can affect the system, and most importantly, what are the best practices? How can you avoid it? Um, you know, the the number one thing with you know cabling and these grounding and bonding systems is it's so much cheaper to do it upfront than have to do it later, or worse yet, have to troubleshoot a problem. Um, if you you know if the time is not taken to factor these things into this design then you end up um, spending, you know, there's all kinds of surveys on this, but you could get into 10 times the cost when you're troubleshooting a problem, or if you have to go back and, you know, pull out cabling that was incorrectly spec'd out or installed, um, it's worth the time to, to do that work upfront before you get too far along with it. Then we talked about codes and standards. So like I said, that the NEC is probably the most dominant, but there's, um, you know, as far as um, getting compliance for systems in North America, there's several other ones. I know we, we talked about three or four other ones, but there's a dozen more we can go into. And, you know, the one thing to know, too, is these most of these standards reference other standards. So it's uh, it does take some time to go through it. Once you start reading it, then you have to um, reference other ones. So then you need to get several different standards in front of you to fully understand. and this is just kind of a starting point of, you know, the main ones to start with, and then you can go from there. And lastly, we talked about other resources and the converged plant-wide Ethernet testing um, that's out there for, um, you know, for everyone to take advantage of. So hopefully that uh, provides some benefit as um, the background for grounding and bonding. And uh, we got about five or six minutes left. So if there's any questions out there online, um, we can talk about it now. Thanks, Jen. Um, we will use this time to answer a few questions. So if you have any questions, please put it in the chat box on the GoToWebinar app. Um, we did have some come in um, while you were presenting. The first one here was, what's your opinion on the best way to separate communication cables from other low voltage systems, i.e. fire alarm in a common cable tray? Um, I, the best, well, I guess the, the two ways, I mean, you could argue which one's best. I think it would depend on the application, but, you know, airspace is ideal if you separate them, but when you're in a cable tray, that's not always feasible. Then I would say the metallic barrier. I know we, we showed one example of it, but I know um, that's more common now with pathways where they'll they'll sell a divider you can put into them um, if they have to be in, this, in the same pathway. I mean, ideally, if they're, you know, if it's a, a life safety system you probably want that completely separated um, but you know I think some of the new products will allow you for that mechanical barrier which um, we actually had some some great demos that we've done in the past um, I, th I think they're even still on YouTube and that too we had where we've showed you could take the victim wire next to the source wire and just put a you know the piece of shielding in between it and you'll see the noise interference without it, and then you slide this piece of shield in there, and then it completely goes away. So I, I would I would go with that. Okay. Our next question here um, is how to properly test the grounding and bonding systems. Yeah, and, and that that's always the the tricky part too. Um, you know, ideally, if you could if you could read even with a, a you know a clamp meter, a lot of times if you're reading the you know, the ground connections to see if you have current flowing, you know, ideally you, 
you should not have. You don't want current on there. Um, so if you can read current on those systems, it's ideal. Um, the other way would just to, you know, um, if you could read the resistance to know um, what your potential difference is from different ones. Um, that, that does become a, an involved project because especially when you get in the grounds, there's um, different tests you can run for, for the soil. And you know, if you have some type of uh, mesh ground that's used, um, sometimes uh, service is required for that because it, it gets more detailed. But generally, if you can, you can read the, you know, the current on those grounds or the potential difference, that's where I would start. Okay. This next question has a lot of details, so let me know if you want me to read this twice, but here goes. Um, what is the best way to bond rooftop structure designs to support communication antennas and the antennas themselves? Assume there is a communication room on the floor below where the cables will run to and be connected to electronics. Wow, that is a very specific question. Yeah, so I don't know um, if that's maybe something we want to reach out to them individually. Yeah, I mean, I guess, I mean, just generally speaking, you know, like mm -hmm. I was, um, you know, I was mentioning the the painted sub panel versus, you know, like a galvanized panel. I mean, the 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 actual connection part is is key, but I I, I think this question is more addressing a grounding system, you know, as far as when you get into um, radio frequencies and that, which would be a, um, you know, a much larger uh, base type approach. Okay. But, but we'd, we'd have to go into that in a little more detail, I think, to properly yeah. answer. And there was also the question that came in, if we're going to be sending a copy of this PowerPoint, um, typically we do send a version with um, your follow-up email and there also is a recording of the webinar itself sent so you'll have uh, both of those options. Sorry that question kind of was for me. Um, another question we have, have here is how do you obtain the different standards? Are they free? Yeah that, that's a good question because like I said one you know will typically reference the other one so it's um, th th there are different um, like online ones that you can get for free. I know like the NFPA standards will allow online access if you register. So you can't you can't download it, you can't get a hard copy, but you can go on and read them. And if you, I mean, if you actually want a hard copy or a, a digital one, they're, they're really not that expensive. Um, I think the NEC one is uh, like 80 or $90. And, you know, the, the handbook one that I mentioned is, is a little more expensive. You know, that's probably more like 180. Um, but again, even the, the TIA ones are usually around a hundred dollars too. So, you know, you, if you want a physical copy, you'd have to purchase them. Um, you know, otherwise, like I said, you could have access just to read a part of it online. Okay. Um, looks like we have time here for one more. Um, is category 6A cable more su susceptible to noise interference than category 5E? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. That, uh, so 6A is a better cable. It has a, you know, a tighter construction to it. Uh, it can, you know, runs at a higher frequency. That's what makes it a 6A cable. Um, and typically the 6A will have a, um, you know, a faster signal on it. So I guess inherently that's more susceptible because of the, the speed you're running. And, you know, with it, with the five cables, not as good, but you know, you can't run 10 gig, a hundred gig on that. So you're running a slower signal. So the five E cable may be uh, good enough to shield off because it's a, um, a lower signal. Okay. Well, it looks like that was our last question. We are right on time here. I want to thank everyone for their questions today and your time. This will conclude today's webinar. Okay, thank you. Thank you.